So these are two problems on the GRE math subject test that a lot of people had trouble with. And I think a big reason is because they involved complex numbers and ways about thinking about them that make these problems quite simpler. So tune into this video to figure out how to manage with them. Hey, welcome to today's video. I'm Prof Omar. And today I wanna to talk about complex numbers appearing on the GRE math subject test. In particular, I want to go over problems 19 and 27 on the current GRE Math Subject Test Practice Book and think about them in detail, looking at approaches that'll help, especially when taking the test. So the first problem I want to look at is number 19, and it says if z is a complex number and z bar is this complex conjugate, what is the limit as z approaches 0 of this quantity right here, the square of the complex conjugate divided by the square of the original complex number? Let's go about this in a brute force way at first, see what we come up with, and then think about a way to see this that might make it easier or more manageable. All right, so let's say z is the complex number a plus bi. Let's actually get explicit expressions for each of these two things on the numerator and the denominator. So first of all, the complex conjugate is a minus bi. Okay, and so if we square the complex conjugate, that's going to be the quantity a minus bi squared, which is a squared minus twice a bi, and then plus bi squared, all squared. bi squared is b squared i squared, and i squared is negative 1. So this is going to be minus b squared. And I want to write this as an actual complex number, so I'll take out the real part, which is a squared minus b squared, and then the complex, or sorry, the imaginary part, which is negative 2ab i. All right, so similarly, the square of z is a plus bi squared, which is, by the same phenomenon, going to be this same expression, but with a plus 2i in the middle instead. So we'll have a squared minus b squared as the real part, and then the imaginary part is 2abi. Okay, and so we can rewrite our limit as the limit of the quotient of these two things. So let's go ahead and do that. We get rid of these pieces. And then the limit we're considering is the limit as z approaches zero of this quantity right over here, where z is a plus bi. Now, just like in multivariable calculus, we can think about this limit as z going to zero and possibly analyzing what happens when we go to zero in different directions, right? We notice that the real parts of these and the are the same, whereas the imaginary parts are different. So if we go along a line that keeps the real parts fixed, and then go along a line that keeps the imaginary parts fixed, we might be getting different things because we have that the real parts are the same, whereas the imaginary parts are different. So let's actually quantify that. Um, so if we look at going to zero, where a is zero, right? Remember, z is a plus, is a plus bi here. So what we're saying is going on, go along a line where the real part of z is fixed, then what happens in this expression is these pieces right here collapse and you're left with the limit as this b is going to zero because we're going along um, a line where this a is fixed of the quantity negative b squared over negative b squared and that quantity is one because the numerator and denominator are identical. Okay, that's great. Now, what about a line where we eliminate the real part? Um, we can do that by moving along z equals zero, where a and b are actually the same, right? In that case, a and b would bo both be going to zero. Um, so this is the limit as z approaches zero with a equals b of whatever this quantity is, which is negative 2abi over 2abi. Right, and since a and b are equal, actually it doesn't matter in this expression that a and b are equal, but 
we'll get that this quantity regardless is negative one. And so this limit along this axis is negative one. And so we see we have a limit of one in one direction and a limit of negative one in another. So there's no possible way that this limit exists. Okay, so this is sort of the brute force way of going about this. Um, but the thing is, how do you come up with these ideas yourself? You'd have to write down Z equals A plus BI, actually get these expressions explicit, and then think about the paths that you wanna choose in order to see that these limits don't, this limit doesn't exist because you have different limits depending on the path that you take. So another way to think about this, which is gonna be the theme of today's video, is instead of thinking about complex numbers in the Cartesian way, think about them in polar form. So instead of writing Z as A plus BI, what we're gonna do is write Z as R times E to the I theta. And what this is quantifying, recall, is the following. If we're in the complex plane, you have a complex number over here, then we can write the vector emanating from the origin. That vector has a length, that length is R, and this angle here, subtending from the X, uh, the uh, real axis is theta. If that's the case, then this number is actually r e to the i theta, where this can be rewritten as r times cosine theta plus i sine theta. So the real part of this complex number is r cos theta, and the imaginary part is r sine theta. Now doing this actually is gonna help quite a bit in this problem and in the problem that we discuss after it. So let's think about what happens with this limit in this particular case. So first of all, the complex conjugate of this expression is r cos theta minus r sine theta i, right? And that can be written as r e to the negative i theta. So we have an explicit expression for the complex conjugate in terms of the actual original complex number itself. So this quantity that we wanna take a limit of is the limit as z approaches zero of this quantity squared, which is r squared e to the negative two i theta divided by this squared, which is r squared e to the two i theta. And this is the limit as z approaches zero of the quantity e to the negative four i theta. Now we can figure out what's going on qualitatively with this limit to figure out the fact that it doesn't exist. We don't have to consider this path argument that we had to come up with on our own before. If you look at this expression here, this expression in terms of a complex number only depends on its phase. It depends on this angle right over here, right? So if we took all the vectors or all the complex numbers that lie along this vector right over here, the quantity for this thing here is gonna be the same regardless of what we choose. So if you go along this vector here, this quotient is gonna be fixed, but it changes depending on what this angle is. So depending on the angle that we come at zero from, we're gonna get a different answer as we move z towards zero. Because of that, there's no possible way that this limit exists. Now this is a great perspective because we get a complete understanding of what's happening with this function right over here. And as the problem on the GRE subject test might be more complicated, um, we get a better insight on what's actually happening with this problem. So let's see how this polar form can be useful in another type of problem that also appears on the GRE math subject test. So the second problem I wanna consider is this problem right over here that asks you to compute one plus i to the 10. And this is problem 27 on the current GRE math subject test practice book. Okay, so we could expand this by using something like the binomial theorem or multiplying this out explicitly, but you can see this is gonna get quite complicated. Instead, let's think about the polar form of this particular complex number. So this complex number in the complex plane lives somewhere like right over here. We have a real part of one and an imaginary part of one. So written in polar form, the length of this thing by, by, by the Pythagorean theorem is the square root of two. And this angle right here, because these two side lengths are the same, is 45 degrees. 
Okay, so this thing in polar form is going to be the square root of 2 e to the i theta, and I'm going to write theta in radians again, and the number of radians here is going to be pi over 4. So this is i pi over 4. Okay, so here is the complex number that we're considering, and now we want to compute the 10th power of it. So I take root 2 e to the i pi over 4 and raise it to the 10, and this can be done much simpler than computing this thing. We'll have root 2 to the 10. This is 2 to the half, so root 2 to the 10 is 2 to the fifth, times e to the i pi over 4 to the 10. We'll multiply this exponent by 10 to get i times 10 pi over 4. 10 pi over 4 is the same as 5 pi over 2. And we can always move by 2 pi because we're considering the angle here. And so we can reduce this by 2 pi to say that it's the same as i pi or i over 2. And so this is 32 times cosine pi over 2 plus i times sine pi over 2. Cosine pi over 2 is 0 and sine pi over 2 is 1. So this gives us an answer of 32i. So we see that moving to polar form allows us to exponentiate a lot easier. So here is the moral of the story with this video today. We saw that when considering things like algebraic expressions in terms of a complex number and its conjugate, it can be beneficial to use the polar form to get a sense of what's going on. Moreover, when exponentiating different complex numbers, it's much more manageable to handle by moving to polar form as well. So this is a strategy that's worked on at least two problems on the GRE Math Subject Test Practice Book, and I think is useful potentially in a lot of the exams that come up. So I hope you liked today's video. If you did, click the like button. And if you want to see more videos for strategies like this, subscribe to the channel.